somewhere in the world and through all the years of fighting and suffering that resulted from it. That was a war ago, and now the day belongs to history. But your children and their children will learn of it and remember it. They'll study all the history that you had to absorb when you were a child, plus all the history that you made and are making. And besides the momentous dates of 1776, 1812, 1861 and 1914, they'll learn of December 7th, 1941. They'll remember Pearl Harbor. Who could ever forget it? This single event affected the life of every citizen of the world, no matter who he is or will be or was. One of them was Dory Miller of Waco, Texas. He was there. And for his distinguished devotion to duty, extraordinary courage and disregard for his own personal safety during the attack, Dory Miller was awarded the Navy Cross. From Pearl Harbor to Tokyo was a long and bitter struggle. There were many battles, and each battle created many heroes. One of them received the Navy and Marine Corps Medal for heroic conduct during four submarine patrols in enemy waters. He was Joseph Cross of New Orleans, Louisiana, and his citation said that his resolute courage was in keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. Of the many ships that fought with honor in the United States Navy, high among them was a destroyer escort, the USS Harmon, named for Leonard Roy Harmon of Curo, Texas, who was killed in action protecting a shipmate. His heroic spirit of self-sacrifice, maintained above and beyond the call of duty, again, was in keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. Many men who might otherwise never have known they were capable of heroism were tested under fire. Many a sailor was wounded in action and fought on. And his fighting spirit and grim determination to carry on in the face of acute pain and waning strength were in keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. Those were the words on the citation of Albert H. Oliver of Little Rock, Arkansas, when he received the Silver Star. And there were others, many others, who never got a medal. That was impossible, for almost every man in the Navy helped make history, each in his own way. In April 1942, Secretary of the Navy Frank Knox announced that the Navy Marines and the Coast Guard wanted Negro volunteers. Negroes responded by the thousands. Training camps were set up at Hampton Institute in Virginia and at the Naval Training Station in Great Lakes, Illinois. The new recruits were sent here to learn the specialized art of waging war, to be transformed from plain American citizens into citizen sailors. That meant beginning at the beginning. For instance, learning the necessary art of recognizing the different kinds of boys. They learned to make compass deviation compensations. They were fitting themselves for a new and strange kind of life. They had to navigate by dead reckoning. They learned to plot a course. They found out what a mercurial barometer was, how to set one, and then how to take readings. They had to learn to use an engine room telegraph. They learned all these new things and then went out on a training ship and put what they learned into practice. They were approaching the day when they would be ready for action. In the meantime, others were finding out how to send and receive radio messages. Some were trained as aviation metalsmiths. Some became aviation machinists' mates. Some became gunners' mates. They learned the art of signaling, how to transmit and receive messages, 
how to translate what the blinking of a signal light meant. They had to learn patrolling and all the special skills that that required. They learned mine sweeping and a host of other jobs. All the varied and special jobs it took to run a Navy destined to become the greatest the world had ever seen. It was a tremendous undertaking, building a strong fleet in so short a time. And yet, if the Navy hadn't met its seemingly impossible obligations, the history of the world might have taken a different turn. These chapters in our history books might have been sorrowful and edged with black instead of being proud with victory. Every sailor's job in the Navy was important, no matter what he did. Every man played a part in building up the Navy machine. This photographer's mate flew many missions over enemy territory in the Pacific. It was his task to photograph enemy terrain and enemy installations, and the pictures he took were used to make mosaic maps. These maps made it possible to plan later battles. This man was the skipper of a Navy oiler, a part of the lifeline of the Navy. There were the women sailors, the waves. Their magnificent job is recorded in the history of World War II. For the first time, women took what were formerly considered jobs for men alone, as clerks, as instructors, as medical technicians, all the many things that women could do to release men for combat duty in the fighting zones. At home, there were the men who did a Navy job, though they wore no uniforms. The civilian workers in the Navy yards. The men who built and rebuilt the ships of the fleet. They felt the effect of the war more keenly than many other civilians, perhaps, because for several years all their working lives were bound up with the war, though they were far from the fighting fronts. There were men in the Navy, too, whose job it was to keep the actual fighters in fighting trim. These were the men of the Ordnance Battalions who helped to make the Navy lethal. In days of peace, it's sometimes hard to realize that men and time and materials had to be put to such a use. But during the war years, these shells guaranteed a chance at future peace and security. Making them was a deadly serious occupation. Throughout the Navy, there was tremendous organization, planning, and human effort. The end results were the ships at sea. Negroes served on most all of them, and some, like this submarine chaser, the USS Mason, were manned almost entirely by Negro crews. This destroyer escort, too, had a crew that was preponderantly Negro. Like all fighting ships, it was ready for action at any moment, and its crew functioned as an intricate, highly efficient organization. There were the gunners, the lookouts, the boatswain's mate, the signalmen who contacted other ships with lights, the radar operators who spotted trouble before it occurred. The radio men. The electrician's mate. The chief motor machinist's mate. The sound man who located submarines by the sound of their motors. All these, together with the others in the crew, were ready to spring into action when the call to battle stations was sounded.
Navy made it possible to move up and across the Pacific, taking island after island from the Japanese. Giant convoys were assembled. The big guns bombarded enemy installations. The land fighters of the Navy, the Marines, took over from there in many of the campaigns. They fought on Guadalcanal and Tarawa and many other places that once seemed strange and far away, if they were known at all. But because of these battles, they will be remembered always in the later history of America. After the landings came the construction battalions of the Navy, the Seabees. They made clearings in the jungle, built roads through it. They built airstrips under pressure of time and the enemy. And when their work was interrupted, they fought. how the Navy played its mighty role in winning the Second World War. The record is there for future generations to study and admire. But it was the people in the Navy who made it great, a cross-section of America. Together they met the gravest crisis in our country's history. They worked together and fought together. They lived up to the highest traditions of the United States Navy.